On today's podcast, we welcome the managing director of Warner Music Thailand, Carl Kangam. We discuss some of Thailand's new generation of artists, the importance of social media in launching new artists, and the importance Thailand's music market has in the global landscape. You don't want to miss it. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Music Business Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Music Business Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we welcome Managing Director of Warner Music Thailand, Carl Kongham. We discuss some of Thailand's new generation of artists, the importance of social media in launching new artists, and the importance in Thailand's music market has in today's global music business. You don't want to miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label a and music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source, serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the ANR Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready, to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, insiders. Today's featured guest is the managing director of Warner Music Thailand, Carl Kangam. It was a very, very interesting interview. You know, I, I mean, when you start getting into the international territories, you're starting to see a lot of different kinds of consciousness, a lot of different kinds of emerging markets that are coming about on the scene. And what I thought was most interesting about what Carl said is number one, which was, you know, almost to be um, expected, is that the Thai market is 70 to 80 percent Thai. Right. And only 20% international artists. Uh, uh, artists. And the other thing that I thought was most fascinating about his, his interview with us, Eric, was that he says no form of music right now is dominant. Nothing right. dominates. Yeah. And I thought what was really amazing, which we kind of already know in our market, but I guess it's happening everywhere, that traditional media doesn't work. When we asked him the question, TV is not moving the needle. Radio is not moving the needle. What's moving the, the needle is things like streaming platforms and, and artists' social media and what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and how social media is probably one of the biggest drivers of new artists right. in that particular territory. Absolutely. And with that, insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our featured conversation with Carl Kongham. Carl, welcome. Nice to be here. Good to have you. I wanted to ask you, I always like to begin these questions because it's different for each person. When in your life did you know that the music business was going to be your professional career path? I never knew. I ne unless the aspirations of a frustrated high school guitarist who wanted to be a rock star back in the 80s. Yeah, that was the only thought I gave to it. And I got introduced by a headhunter about six years ago saying Warner Music Thailand is looking for a managing director. And I said, Warner Music Thailand exists? I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it, but it must have been fate. It just seems, it seems like where I meant to be. This is Eric. Thank you so much, Carl, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, how would you describe Thailand's music market today? Well, it's very domestically focused. About 70 to 80% of the consumption is domestic, Thai language. But it's really dynamic. It's, it's varied. There's no dominant genre anymore. I think that's a product of the new platforms and COVID locking people down. So... There's an artist for you, whatever your tastes are in Thailand, and it's really creative. It's really amazing. I think you're going to see some Thai artists breaking on to either a regional or global stage, hopefully mine, <laughs> in the, in, in, sooner than later, actually. Okay. How would you say, you know, it's interesting hearing your answer. From that point of view, how would you say that Thailand's musical landscape has evolved or the musical tastes has evolved over the last five years or so? Because you've talked about the, the expansion of that. 
Yeah, it used to be the Thai market used to be driven by two ma- two major local labels, of which only one exists now, and they basically rammed what they wanted down people's throats. They owned all the media, and it was driven by them, but it was also driven by the major revenue driver for artists in Thailand, which is pubs. Like they hire showbiz in Thailand is pub shows, restaurants, bars, and so on and so forth. So pub owners are you know are older, and they just want to hire the bands to play the things that they think people want to hear. So in the past, there was very little room for artistic deviation, different styles, things that people, you know, aren't going to want to drink to, basically, right? So, but now, especially through the pandemic, people are actually, listeners are actually more open and searching for more. So there's less, there's no major media anymore. Radio is irrelevant. TV doesn't really make an impact anymore. So it's all in the hands of listeners and what they choose to listen to, and then what the algorithms feed up to them. So it makes my, my, my job really difficult, but it makes it really amazingly interesting. So I've got 20 artists right now, and they are all stylistically quite different, right? At one point, I had six artists completely different, from metalcore to EDM to city pop to shoegaze to R&B. So there's real potential, but it's, it makes it difficult to, to break out. So I think it's because it's decentralized now in terms of who tells you what to listen to? You get to choose. It's really democratized. Yeah, and it kind of leads me to my, to the next question, which you kind of answered a little bit, but I wanted to see if you can go into more detail. What are the primary methods of accessing music in, in Thailand today? Is it radio, video? I mean, you said it's kind of decentralized now. So digital streaming platforms, obviously, and YouTube is the main one, and still driven by the free tier, so ad-supported stuff. Spotify launched five and a half years ago, just before I joined Warner. Prior to that, it was Apple Music and a few local platforms. So it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, and then, you know, all the platforms you can access. But those are the main ones right now. As the managing director of Warner Music Thailand, how important is social media in marketing your artists domestically? It's, it's vital. And it's not really as a marketing tool. It's more a CRM tool, right? Like if you can cultivate the right fans, the fans are going to push your artists over the top, right? And different artists have different types of fan bases, you know? I've got one artist right now and his fan base is rather rabid, almost like a K-pop fan base. But they're amazing, right? And they really work hard to market my artists. I've got fans of him in the US who are buying ads on Instagram and targeting countries where they, they ask me, where should I target? Well, just stream, I'm okay. I don't need your money, but if you're going to really do invest in my artists, that's fine. So it's if the artists can build up their core fan base because it's so hard to get to people right now, right? And, 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 and then keep that relationship alive. Keep the fans invested in you. Then, 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 then you're golden, right? Because it's hard because the editors of the DSPs, they have so much coming in at them. There's what, 100,000 new songs a day right now? Like, so you really need to bypass that. You know, if they love you and they give you the support, that's a bonus on top. But you need to create your own destiny as an artist and a label working with the artist as a partner. We try to figure out the best ways for different types of artists to utilize the appropriate social media platform. So for some, it might be TikTok. For others, it might be Instagram. You know, for others, it might just be their YouTube channel and they're really great at creating music-related content that people want to come back to. So correct me if I'm wrong, where you were where you were just saying with the artists that you had that had the rabid fan base, you had actual fans of theirs that were actually running ads for or wanting to run ads for them? For they that? did run ads for them. Not <laughs> wow. only did they run ads for them, so they it's it's weird, right? It's an artist named Jeff Satur. And he's got kind of an idol. He was an act, he was in a he acted in a series recently, and that's how he blew up worldwide. Worldwide, I don't want to say he's a superstar, but he's got fans everywhere. Let's say he had a birthday at the beginning of March. His fan clubs from around the world contacted each other, put money in a pot, rented out a seven hundred seat auditorium in Bangkok to a congregate in hopes that he would show up, and he did. And he showed up and played wow. a few songs for them, and they were there like from noon until ten at night waiting for him, and and then they collected money, they bought him guitars, they buy, you know, wow. I just got a message now while I was waiting from a US based person saying, I figured out how to buy ads in, in the billboard in Times Square. <laughs> oh my I, I just, I, I asked that because I wanted to make sure because I was so blown away about what you said that the, the fan base is that rabid that they were ready to put their own money, which obviously Warner Music doesn't need the money, but well, it helps. It helps. It, it, it helps. But, you know, yeah. but it's not really about the money. It's about the dedication and, right. and the commitment. And it makes my job a bit tricky because if, if I'm seen as not supporting the artist in the way that they think he or she should be supported, then it comes down on me. And these people are amazingly resourceful. 
somebody tagged me in a picture with one of my team who works with this artist on Instagram. And then within two days, I got friend requests from the fan club in the US and Hong Kong and Italy and China, China, but they're based in Australia from all around the world, Brazil. It's incredible. And now they're like sending me messages all the time saying, when's the next song coming? That's up? amazing. Can you buy more merch? The merch is sold out kind of thing. Well, that's great for you guys because now you have brand ambassadors that can go out and just, you know. We have advocates, right? The, yeah. the artist has someone really willing to, to advocate for them, to fight for them and to promote them. And they're your best tool. And you've achieved what you had talked about just a minute ago, which is the idea of a fan base, but having people's attention. That I mean, that was something that I, I, I heard, you know, Raleigh was talking to us earlier about that people were talking on the panel about being able to monetize, you know, a lot of these platforms today can't monetize. And my whole thing is, is that today we monetize with attention. And that seems to be what you're talking about. You have these people's attention who are devoted to your artists, who are willing to, as Eric says, put time, money, and energy into like marketing around the world in terms of actually supporting them. That, that can't be bought. No, I can't. And but you need to treat it well because it's yeah. precious and it's fragile. Right? Yes. Because the next artist around the corner and you know, people's attention isn't fixed all the time. So you need to continually engage them. You disappear for six months and don't release something or don't do something, you know, something else gets in the way. Valentina Ploy was an artist who came to Warner Music via independent label What the Duck. She represents the new generation of singer songwriters. I want to ask you today, is there a greater emphasis being placed on breaking Thai artists, breaking internationally? For me, yes, right? And international, how, what does that mean? It might mean regionally, right? Depending on what the artist is, the genre, and so on and so forth. Valentina Ploy, I mean, she is still technically in Thailand signed to What the Duck, but Warner is trying to show the value of the Warner network. And it's something that we're working through, right? How can Warner work with local partners and friends to, to extend the reach? Because they don't have offices everywhere. So she is somebody that, you know, one of the senior, senior Warner executives really likes and thought, let's try. Let's see if we can rally the troops around this artist and learn from it. And we are learning from it. It's not, no, maybe ideally it could have gone faster and she could be doing better, but she's someone we believe in. And I still think... I believe, I mean, I was just talking about it. I believe in the artist development process. And I think Warner is trying to come back to this and, and steer away, you know, have that balance between more is more, more releases, more market share, but really realizing that, you know, for me anyway, our lifeblood is the artist, right? If we treat the artist just as a commodity, as a song, as a release, and try to like squeeze more releases out of an artist without actually developing them, then we're not, we're not doing ourselves a favor. And it's, to me, it's a spiral down and, and it's exhausting, right? Chasing the next TikTok hit or whatever. I mean, I, it, I think we're learning from that, that, you know, th there's often not a follow-up TikTok hit to somebody who's, yeah, I've never seen an artist break through TikTok. I've seen songs blow up, but how do we work with our artists to, to grow their fan base, whether it's through social media, someone like Valentina Ploy, she's, we've actually developed her with the network and now her biggest market, I believe, is Taiwan and the Philippines and then Thailand. So. It's not about trying to hit every market at once, but take those steps and grow those fan bases where we see the green shoots and then use that to, to move on to maybe neighboring territories, grow the stream so that she may become more interesting to the West because numbers mean something. Uh, let's not be naive about that, right? right. Um, so we are a small region. Spotify is still new. So, you know, it's not, if, if, even if you get in the best playlist, you're not going to get millions of streams right away. So you need to aggregate all your fans and then, make that case for, for the artist. You know, you, you mentioned earlier that you have been at Warner Music now for five and a half years. Yeah. Okay. In that time, has the Thai market that you're managing director of Warner's, which is one of the major labels, have they become more receptive to international artists during this period? Or, or is it mainly strictly the same in terms of the international market, in terms of Thai artists, local? This is anecdotal. I haven't looked at the data, but my take is that because of the diversification and people are free to choose what they listen to, the superstars are actually suffering. I mean, they'll never suffer. They, you know, Ed Sheeran can come and, and sell out a stadium, but it might be a, a heavier lift than it was in the past, right? Because, but what I see now is a lot of these sort of niche international artists or artists from the region, and they're coming in and they're still in the early stages of development and they're able to come in and play to 500 people, right? And there's a lot more interest in that of different genres. So you've got, I guess the biggest name would be like some of the 88 rising people like Joji or, or people like that. 
we're one of their biggest markets, right? They're the cool kids really leaning into that. Or we recently had Alec Benjamin come in. Johnny Stimson is a, is one that we, I think, we in Thailand, I think is one we could develop for the future, right? But he came in and played to a few hundred people. It's great. And, and they could all sing his song. So very leaned in. Whereas before it was sort of leaned back, right? Okay, superstar A is here. Everybody save up some money, go see the show. Whereas now it's like, mm, maybe not. Maybe I don't need to see, you know, the, the global superstar because I really like this kind of music more. So you see a lot more different genres. I think pop, unless you're at the very top, it's very diff difficult. There's only one person who can fill the, the pop queen, right? There's only one Dua Lipa. If you like Dua Lipa and you come to Thailand, you probably won't do as well as you would maybe in, in, in a different country in Southeast Asia, which is more sort of pop centered. Hey, Insiders, we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way. But before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. So, hey, Rich, tell me a little bit about the Music Business Registry. Well, what we are, Music Business Registry is the leading contact directory. We publish all of the most current, accurate, and up-to-date contact information for the music industry. We do directories for a and &R. We do directories for music publishers. We do directories for film and television music. We do directories of artist managers. And we do directories of music attorneys. And we also sell other publications too, like the Indie Bible Series, the YouTube Bible Series, the Indie Spotify Bible Series, and other things as well. That's what we're about. So if I wanted to find out, let's say, the music supervisor for American Horror Story, I can kind of go into the film and TV uh, monthly and find the information that I need there? Well, we don't list specific shows. If you know know who the music supervisor is, and you can find that out on IMDb, then you can find their contact information. And we have that in our film and television music monthly. Absolutely. Yes. That's great. And I hear that we have a discount right now. If you go to musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll receive 10% off your first order. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. We offer that to all of the uh, MUBUTV insiders. So insiders, check out musicregistry.com and use MUBUTV10 as your coupon code. Speaking of Southeast Asia, which, you know, consists of Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia, is expected to become one of the most significant music markets in the world over the next five to 10 years. And I'm curious, what factors have contributed to this explosive growth? I wonder what you mean by significant, because there's a lot of different things, right? I think from a Western standpoint, it's already proving its worth by art, Western artists using, whether it's the Philippines or Indonesia or even Thailand to break. So, you know, I, I think Dua Lipa broke through the Philippines. We had Han breaking through Thailand, right? A bit of more of a cool kid thing. Indonesia, the same. So I think we love our music. That, that, uh, there's no denying. Everybody loves music, but Asians really love, you know, Southeast Asia is it, very uh, dynamic. I think the mistake is to assume that all the markets are the same and they're not especially in terms of listener taste and behavior. So in Thailand, I think we skew more towards like the more indie cool kids music. We have a lot of affinity with North Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan even, whereas a country like Indonesia or the Philippines, from what I see, I'm not an expert on those countries, is more pop. They're more receptive to English language music and, and, and the superstars do well there. Malaysia is a completely different beast. It's got three markets in one country. It's got the Chinese market, the English market, and the Malaysian market. So... I think from artists, from Western artists breaking, for sure. I think from a domestic artist, I think people are more open to listening to new things now, even through the region. I think digital streaming is still nascent, so that will definitely grow. And if we can, you know, drive those numbers, drive listenership, convert people from free to premium, then, then you'll see the numbers still continue to climb and then it'll probably plateau and then we're going to have to figure out you know, what next, but it's still in the early stages of growth and we love to play. So things like the alternative platforms, TikTok, you know, uh, maybe it's a generational thing, maybe every country. I haven't, I haven't lived in the West in, a, in quite a while. So I'm sure that, you know, TikTok has a hold on the kids these days here too, but people love to play and they love to explore. And in Thailand, especially, they love to lean in and they're not afraid to try out new things and to figure it out. I think, for example, Instagram, I think Thailand was the first, one of the first countries where people actually used Instagram as like a commercial platform, you know, selling stuff, online sales, using Instagram, creating platforms. And then the influencer sort of scene sort of blew up, right? We find ways to, 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 to use the platforms in new ways. And I think that's, that's, a, that's interesting. Throughout your life, Carl, have there been any films or books that you've read that have been particularly 
inspiring to you, professionally speaking, that you could recommend to our our uh, audience? Professionally speaking, I try to read more fiction, so that's more sort of like just to to to, to shut down. But I really like watching right now. Well, when I started in the music, you know, I've always had a passion for music, but I don't know anything about the business. So I love documentaries. So if you can find any music documentary, I would hoover them up. You know, the defiant ones is just mm. to me, oh brilliant, I mean, excellent. I put that on repeat, right? Yeah, yeah that's um, a brilliant documentary. I mean, I suffer from a very bad memory, but any music documentary I would watch. Anything about bands or artists, or in particular, or anybody in the industry, I would watch. Yeah, sure. There's one. I mean, if you're into documentaries, because I, I show the defiant ones to my students, is the documentary. It's also four hours, like the defiant ones was. It's called Shangri La. Okay. And it's all about the creative process with Rick Rubin. It's astonishing. It's a brilliant on how he pulls the creativity out of such a wide diverse of talent. I just but bought his book. I just, oh, okay. His new book. So I ordered it, pre-ordered yeah. it from Amazon. So I'm just going through it. It's it's great. It's like little Zen memes and uh, not memes, like little snippets of, right. of inspiration. Yeah. Excellent. Carl, what advice can you offer our listeners who are wanting to pursue a career in the business side of the music industry? I would hope you're doing it for the right reasons, you know, and when you get into the business side, and especially if you work in a big company, it's easy to get cynical. You've got lots of targets and that, that's a reality, right? You're not doing this as a charity. You want to do it. But if you're not driven by the right reasons and the right reasons is a love for the music and respect for the artist and really trying to being invested with, with them, whether it's an artist facing model that you're working on or whether you're in publishing or, or whatever, right? If you're doing it to elevate that, then I think you're, in the right place. If you're just doing it because of the glamour, the perceived glamour of, oh, I get to hang out with, you know, creative people, you're not in the right place. I mean, my father's a doctor and, you know, half Asian kid growing up. Most, most of my Asian friends in university went into med school, engineering or dentistry, right? My father took me aside and said, Carl, don't be a doctor. And I said, I wasn't planning on it, but why, why would you even say that? They said, because you'd be a terrible doctor. And I said, why? Because you don't want to be a doctor. So it was his way of relieving the pressure on me. And I think, yeah, that's the only advice. And you really, if you love it and you believe in it, you'll fight through all the difficult days and not feel exhausted. Same question, but, but on the reverse, what advice would you have for our listeners who want to become recording artists, who have that as a committed career path for themselves? The most successful and the interesting ones that I have it's not that they want to be, it's just that they are, right? They're musicians, they're artists already, and there's something that drives them, right? If they want to be, then it's really, for me, it's difficult to work with. And I would say, I, I, I come from advertising in my previous life, so we look at our artists, I look at my artists in the framework of a brand, right? Who are you? Who do you appeal to? What do you believe, right? And if you can stick true to that and continue to innovate and learn and be open to the inputs, you'll be more inspired and inspiring in the outputs. And if you are happy and satisfied with your work, that's, it's a bit cliche, but it will, you, then you find the right partners to work with to get your music, your art to the right audiences. And it's going to get harder, right? The audiences are scattered and diverse and it's, uh, you know, there's no huge spotlights now anymore saying you must listen to this artist. So it's going to be difficult, but if your passion is there and it's driving you and you stay true to yourself and you don't try to, oh, zig because the market's doing that. Or right now the kids are listening to this and I'm going to become, you know, uh, I'm going to do 90 second TikTok songs or something like that. Then that's a bit cynical. So do it for the right reasons as well, but find the right partners. I don't, even now I work for a major label. I, I can't do it without the right partners, whether it's the, we don't really have artist managers, but if you're, you know, find the right manager, find a good lawyer, find the right touring agent. I think there's nothing that can replace people experiencing you, right? You know, it doesn't matter how good technology gets and live streaming and, you know, FaceTime or, you know, Instagram live chat. There's nothing that can replace that. Just being in a grungy bar or something like that, or, you know, in a park or seeing a busker or just like into it, right? And find those right partners and, and, and stick to the basics before getting like distracted by, oh, I need an NFT or, you know, that right. may come. That may be in your revenue matrix that makes sense for that type of artist, but if you can't get people to love the music first, I had an artist want to do an NFT when it first broke out. And I said, that's great. It would look cool, but you can't, you, let's concentrate on selling out the 50 t-shirts that I just made. And if you're not able to do that, then maybe the NFTs can be done later, right? Focus on the art. You know, Carl, where can people best connect with you and uh, Warner Music Thailand? Well, my email, 
carl.concom, K-O-N-G-K-H-A-M at warnermusic.com is my personal one. Warner Music Thailand, I think our websites, it's, we don't really focus on it so much, so our socials. So Warner Music Thailand Facebook, uh, we also have two sub-labels, one called Wafer Records, uh, W-A-Y-F-E-R Records, and another one called Dumb Recordings, D-U-M-B Recordings. It stands for Don't Underestimate Me, Bitches. Sorry, I don't know if I can say that. Absolutely. That's yeah, our more playful absolutely. fighting yeah. brand. That's uh, a great one. <laughs> that's our play. I have, actually, I didn't bring any swag, but uh, we have a great t-shirt too. So yeah, look up all our socials. The main ones would be Facebook and Instagram. Wonderful. Carl, we thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate yeah, it very, very much. much. It was my pleasure. Wow. What a great interview. You know, I, yeah. I love when we get to speak to people from other territories. Absolutely. That's, that's you know, and he, and he had so much great information to tell us. I, I love the fact that he spoke about that no dominant genre exists right now in Thailand. Right. And I love the fact that he said that, you know, most music, which was to be expected, is about 80% focused on the, the Thai language. But he had so many other great points. How, you know, Thailand now is open to many, many more styles than they ever were in the past. Right. That that was a very interesting feature. Yeah. One of the things that I was blown away with was how fans, you know, he talked about social media being a CRM more than anything else, yes. which is, you know, getting fans. And what I thought was amazing was he was talking about one particular artist, which he didn't name the artist, but he talked about how the fans are so rabid with that particular artist that they're actually taking out ads in their markets and running Facebook ads uh, or Spotify ads for this art. That blew me away. I had never heard anything like that. You know, talk about taking the fan, the fandom to another level. Now you've got artists that are paying for, to run your ads. That that's amazing to me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the thing that I thought was so interesting is that, you know, as you were speaking, I'm, I'm realizing that's how you spread the word internationally about other artists. When you can get other markets in the fan base to spread the word about them, perhaps in other markets exactly. you know, that they're not in. The other thing that I thought was so interesting about what he talked about was the actual social media, how he spoke about how YouTube is the number one leading driver of, of music exposure in Thailand. Yes, there are streaming services like, you know, well, Apple Spotify, I think Spotify, had come in like five years, five ago, years yeah. ago, but how YouTube is the main driver. Right. That, that, and that's a visual medium. Yeah. And that everything has become decentralized. He he talked about the idea that there was two, I think, companies that were running the music industry. And I think one of them fell by the wayside. And he was talking about how that market is basically comprised of a lot of pub shows and restaurants that have performances in that market because it's such a unique, small market. And I thought that that was something that was, you know, really fascinating. And, and thinking that you, I think you mentioned about it earlier, that there is no dominant language anymore, that artists are going from regional to global in a big way over there. Yeah, very much so. So, and this goes right to the heart of the fact that, you know, Thailand is, you know, it's part of the Southeast Asia market. And I, I believe that the Southeast Asia market is going to become over the next three to five years, one of the most, if not the most significant music market in the world. Hey, insiders. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top-rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes and our space. You can also find us at social media at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter X, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Music Business Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon, and be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Music Business Insider Podcast.